Mark chapter 10. Folks, I'm going to be honest. I've been going through some things for years, and uh, there's been so many highs and so many lows and so many things I've been trying to figure out and iron out and step into. And it's been a rocky journey. It really has. I'm just being honest. Um, and I remember some things in my youth as a saved person, not my physical, natural youth, but my my youth as a Christian. Yeah. I remember some things that had ultimately gone away. Um, I was still experiencing God. I was still doing great things. A lot of stuff was still happening. People still getting saved. Folks still getting healed and all that kind of stuff. Still taking food to people and hearing the voice of God, all that stuff. But something was different. When I was first saved, I had felt something. I had an experience. I told Bonnie on the way here, I may or may not tell this, but I feel like I probably should. And I don't want to leave you with a thousand theological unanswered questions when I say this. So don't get wrapped up into why or what this means. I'm just going to tell you based, I'm just going to tell you what my experience was and what I felt. Now, I suspect I know how to reconcile it, but I don't want to turn it into a message. So just disregard the why part and just hear what happened. Let me go ahead and read Mark 10 first, verse 28, if you would stand. Mark 10, 28 says, Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. Let's read it again. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we left, we have left all and have followed thee. Let's pray one more time. Father, we thank you for your word. And I thank you, God, that it's alive and active and sharp. I thank you that it divides asunder soul and spirit. And I thank you, God, that there is a division between soul and spirit. And I'm asking God that you would cause us to understand what that means and what it looks like. I'm asking, Lord, that you take this word tonight and plant it into hearts. I'm asking that you cause it to bear fruit. The same stuff I always ask, God, if by chance I pray something extra great, but you know where I'm coming from. Cause it to break forth in hearts and in minds and to bear great fruit, to, to do and everybody hear what you want to do. I'm sure, God, that you're wanting to speak to the people of this house, and I'm asking that you help us to get a hold of it, to understand and to step into it. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all can be seated. Mark 10, 28, then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. So when I was first saved, you're going to hear a lot of things you've heard before, but I don't know what you're going to hear. Just bear with me. When I was first saved, I, man, I had a passion for the Lord. He who is forgiven much loves much. And I was forgiven a lot. So I was over the top. Most people couldn't receive me. I was too much for them. I was not palatable for most of Christianity because it, I suppose, challenged their version of Christianity. And it caused people to take inventory when they looked at my life. And I am not tooting my horn because I'm going somewhere negative. But I had a fervency, it was on, on the streets, I had a passion. I spoke and witnessed to everybody. I was filled with the Holy Ghost. Very quickly, early in my salvation, and had a fervency, man. I had a fire burning like you wouldn't believe. Nobody heard anything other than Jesus. They wanted to talk to me about the weather. I didn't have anything to say about the weather. The Bible says, out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. So I couldn't find anything but Jesus. I would sit down with family on the couch. They'd want to talk to me about the game. What game? I've not watched a game in eight years. And when I did, it was because I was gambling. They want to sit and talk to me about what's going on next week or what's going on down there at Aunt Ruth's house and all this different stuff. And I'm not trying to be rude uh, to my family or whoever wants to chat. But I'm thinking, it's just not in there. But then they'll say, how's church going? Next thing I know, I'm on an hour rant about Jesus. I'm over the top and they're walking out of the room. Seriously. That's where I was. I was fervent. I was overflowing. I was passionate. But as I said, I think the last service and probably the service before that and the service before that, the deceitfulness of sin and my ability to fail and to fall on my face and to drop the ball over and over again a little bit at a time began to chisel away at that fervency and that passion. 
It began to rob me of what it was that I had in the beginning. And somewhere along the line, some things became stagnant. And even when I was still seeking God and fervent in some manner, something wasn't right. I'm going to tell you something I've never really told anybody. Bonnie just found out today. There was a time when we had first met that we were both in sin because of temptation. Now you can draw your own conclusions. But because of it, I wasn't honoring God and I was having a hard time. There came a time quickly, just weeks later, that I said, here's the deal. I've got to have Jesus. I've got to serve Jesus. And I've got to do it right. If that means that you've got to go and I serve the Lord, then so be it. The entire reason that we came together was because I couldn't control myself as a brand new believer being a man. Just being real. But it got old and I said, look, I've got to have Jesus and I'm sick and tired of failing God. I'm sick and tired of dishonoring the Lord. But there was an occasion in which I was in a position of sin. I cannot explain to you without going into an entire message to do it what happened. But I'm telling you now, I'm aware of what happened. In a moment's time, I began to feel a vibration and a pressure on my head as if something pulled away and wasn't there anymore in the middle of my sinning. Something changed. I felt it. And I'm telling you, I haven't felt it the entire time I've been saved since. I'm not saying I've not had a fervency. I'm not saying I've not walked in power. I'm not saying there's not been oil in my lap. I'm not saying that. But something changed dramatically on that day. And I would look back every now and then and say, God, I, what happened to what I used to have in the beginning? What happened to those days when I used to feel your presence like waves? Just up and down, I'd feel it like literal heavy waves of electricity and power. What happened to those days? I, I feel your presence every day. I feel that in some manner every day, but not to the same degree. Where'd it go? And then I'll remember that occurrence as if God reminded me. There would be days that go by and things would happen. I would fail God and I'd think, God, I haven't had visions and dreams like I used to. I used to have them all the time. What happened? And I began to realize that something changed on that day. When I felt something changed, something changed. So today I was at the office and God's been dealing with me for weeks. Even more than that, as you should know by now, in respect to my conversation being in all manner of holiness, everything I say, everything I do, everything I think aligning with a holy standard. And again, I'm not stepping across lines that aren't in the Bible, but God's been dealing with my heart about purity. He's been dealing with my heart about consecration and set apart, holy living. So I've been in that place for weeks. And I'll make the prayers, God, this is what I want. This is what I desire. Help it to come to pass. Cause it to come to pass. I'll continue on in my life. And nothing really shifts. Nothing really changes in the way that I'm envisioning. Nothing's happening like I would hope that it would. So I've been praying that prayer for weeks. That's been my desire. I think about it all the time. God, I want everything that I'm about, my entire being, to be as Christ is. I really do want it to be a holy life, spirit, soul, body, and garment. I really do want to be counted as barley, God. I really do want to escape that hour of temptation. I want to be found faithful. I want to be worthy to escape all things coming to pass in the world that I might stand before the Son of Man as it is written. God, I really do want my soul salvation to look a lot more like my spirit salvation. When I get there, I'm not wanting things to be burnt up as with the fervent heat. God, I really do want to live my life in a way that's honorable to you in the highest degree as much as possible in every respect. There's stuff in my life that's been in my life reoccurring for years that I don't ever want to see again. But I can't figure out, God, and I'm sick and tired, to be honest, of when I come to you in prayer, when I get to speaking, I hear my own words and I say, God, I sound just like Paul in Romans chapter 7. I said, God, I'm tired of doing the things that I would not. I'm tired of not doing the things that I would. I'm sick and tired of wrestling with what is contrary to what I would have and what you would have for me. And I know Romans 8 tells us about walking in the Spirit. And I know the entire New Covenant tells us how to walk in the Spirit. I get that. But there was something else I wasn't seeing. 
So today I was, I began to pray and I started to pray and it was one of those prayers we've bound to all have been there at some point where I'll say, God, I, I, this is what I see. This is what I'm experiencing. This is what I'm feeling. And then next thing I know, I start thinking about that thing and my mind wanders for about 60 seconds. And I'm like, God, sorry, I just got to thinking about it. Uh, back to what I was saying. And then I'll begin to pray the same thing again. My mind begins to wander again. I start thinking about this thing I'm praying about. And then I'm like, God, I'm sorry, I just can't keep my mind in there. I keep thinking about the problem. And then I just, I don't know what overcame me, what it was, but I fell on the ground and got on my knees and I began to seek the Lord. I began to pour my heart out to Jesus. And I began to be legitimately concerned with myself and sorry for the things that I've allowed in my life over the years. And I began to pray prayers unto the Lord about how I, I really am sorry that I've, I've allowed this and I've allowed that and I've, I've, I've given place to these things in my life so much. I said, God, I don't want that. You know I don't want that. That's not who I am. That's not what I'm about. I've got to have this out of my life. If I can be honest, I've examined myself over and over again. I've tried everything. I've cut off. I've plucked out. I've fasted. I've prayed. I've fasted, Lord, for two weeks straight. I've done everything I can think to do. In fact, I fasted for 12 days one time and fell flat on my face in the middle of fasting. I said, God, I don't know what else to do at this point. I've given up this. I've turned my back on that. I've thrown away social media. I've tried everything I know to try. I've affirmed continually. I've fixed my mind on things above. That's really the only thing that helps, but there's still something I need help with. What is it? So as I'm praying, I lightly feel the presence of the Lord, which is not unusual. I just, I lightly feel it, which is comforting because it says God's I know he's always in me. You get that. We know that. But to feel his presence says God's hearing me. He's, he's with me right now. He's aware of what I'm saying. He knows that I'm genuinely concerned with the things that's been going on in my life for who knows how long. And to feel the light presence of the Lord was enough to compel me to continue to dig, dig in in prayer, to continue to pour myself out, to continue to seek the Lord. Next thing I know, I'm on my face in the office there, and I'm, I'm crying out to the Lord in a way that I really haven't in a long time. And this is what I noticed, that as I was praying, I said something that if I can be honest, I'm not sure I've said since I was first saved. But when I said it, it was not just words. It was not just me saying anything just because I thought that's what God wanted to hear. It came out of the heart. It just overflowed. And I meant every last bit of it, 100% of me was in that prayer. I said, God, I know you gave me a family. I know you gave me a home. I know you gave me kids. I know for what in the world, every reason you gave me a church and people that actually come. Don't know what you were thinking. I know you gave me this. You gave me a good job that pays way too much for a family. You gave me all of these things, but God, I'm telling you, I take all of this that you gave to me and I lay it at your feet. I'm laying everything that I've got down right now. And if you take it all away right now, all I want is Jesus. You can take every last thing you gave me. Take my life. Take the breath you put in my lungs. I want to serve you with everything that I am and all that I've got. I cannot go on another day hanging on to life. I cannot try to gain my life and gain yours at the same time. I lay it down. And folks, when I said that, I began to feel a presence wash over me. I rolled over on my back and I began to feel from head to toe something happening. And it went on for a couple of minutes and I knew I was being filled in a way that's not happened in years. And it, it paused for a moment. I continued to pray. I continued to just praise the Lord and it happened again. And I continued to pray, continued to praise the Lord and it happened again. And I continued to pray, and I continued to praise the Lord. It happened again, but it was hot. And it was fiery that time. And I felt something burning. And then I felt a pressure and a tingling on my forehead. And I thought, the same thing that went away that day is coming back right now. I'm not going to tell you what that looks like theology, but I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, folks, that thing that I said, God, where did it go? What was that? I'm telling you, that was my lap. 
And that lamp of mine is overflowing. That lamp of mine is abundant and beyond measure right now. That God set a fire, an oily fire in me once again. That I'm telling you I've not felt in at least seven or eight years. That I've not felt in a long time. That he set a fire in me brand new today. I couldn't hardly move. And I'm telling you at the end of that prayer, I was, I was ready to stay there for another two, three, four hours. God said, get up. It's time for you to go back. I got up, I said, I gotta look at my clock. I can't wait to see what time it is. And when I got back to my clock, we were right there in an hour. God knew that my time was up. He said, I've done what I've got to do right now. I want you to get back up and go to work. I know you'd stay here with me all day, but now time is up. And what I'm saying to you right now is this. Mark chapter 10, verse 28 says, Then Peter began to say to him, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. And I'm telling you, folks, what I said to Jesus from the bottom of my heart, man, God, I laid down everything. I lay down my family. I won't forsake them, but I don't put them before you not another day. I lay down my job. I lay down my income. I lay down my health. I lay down myself. I lay down this church. I lay down the people. I put it all down, God. It's not another day. I walk in anything that brings me glory. That's fine. I want to serve you. I want to honor you. I want every day to be all manner of holy conversation. I want to live a life well pleasing unto you in Christ Jesus. God, I got to have it. And I'm telling you, when I did that, folks, and when I meant it, that's when it shifted. That's when it shifted. What am I saying to you? Some of you is looking for something that I'm convinced you're not going to find until you really do lay it all down. Believe me, folks, I spent years fasting, praying, repenting, changing, cutting off, plucking out, Doing everything I thought I could do. But you know what I wasn't doing? I wasn't really surrendering. I was coming to God with my arms around everything that I am and everything that I have. Saying, God, I want to do everything for you the way you want me to do it. I want to honor you. But I just don't really want to do it a certain way. I didn't say that in my mind or in my heart. But that was clearly the, the, the point. That every time I came to God, I wanted something to happen, but I didn't want certain things to change. What happened today that didn't happen before was I said, God, I come to you, and I don't care what tomorrow looks like. I don't care what moving forward looks like. If i got to sleep under a park bench and be a vagabond the rest of my life, if that's what brings you glory, if that's what you've called me to, so be it. I don't care. God, if you shut the church doors and you want me to serve somewhere sweeping the floors and cleaning toilets somewhere else, I don't care. What if you want to God. If you want me to stay at home with the kids while Bonnie makes 50 bucks an hour, I don't care. Whatever you want to do. I just want to honor you. Whatever you want to say, whatever you want me to do, however you want me to do it, God, my life is yours. I have left all in my heart to follow thee. I said today when I was laying on my face, I didn't take anything with me. I said, God, I appreciate all that you've given me, all that you're doing in me, all that you're doing through me, all that you're doing in my life. I appreciate it. I don't take it for granted. I'm not turning my back on my family. Don't misunderstand. I'm not turning my back on the church. Don't misunderstand. But all of that is second, if not worse, to Jesus Christ because he is far above. He is the one that's worthy. And if my life isn't given unto him, then what am I doing? I hate to go here because the Pentecostal church, which is Pentecostal in name only, the most of them, mm -hmm. has worn it out. But let's go to Acts chapter 2. Folks, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I know God's been calling the people to lay on their face as Joshua did before the commander of the Lord's army. I didn't fully understand why, but I knew it. I'm telling you, God's been calling people to a holy conversation. God's been calling us to be a faithful, borrowing people, and not an unfaithful, weak people. That God's been calling us to live a consecrated, holy, separated, sold out life. And we've seen bits and pieces of it in every message for like six weeks. Acts chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost 
was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them clothing tongues of fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Let me just be honest, folks. When I was laying in the floor there today, there was a language that came out of my mouth that sounded grossly different than the language that I've been speaking in for the last who knows how many years. Yeah. And it's not to say it wasn't the same Holy Ghost, but there was a different measure of unction behind it. There was a different measure of fire and oil behind that prayer. Something changed in that prayer meeting, and I'm telling you that's exactly what it was. And when I said, God, you have my life, you can have my being, you can have my resources, my assets, my friends, my family, my job, my everything, it's yours, God. I need you. You're the only one I need. I said, God, I know now's not the time for requests, but I've got one. I said, God, as I do this, make me holy as you are holy. Make me holy as you are holy. Folks, I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost has come to make you holy. The Holy Ghost don't care whether or not you're happy. He's not come to make you healthy. That's what he does. That's what he's about. But his ultimate goal is to make you holy as he is holy. And as I was laying there, I said, God, make me holy through and through. I'm not here to barter with you. I'm just asking God and believing for in return whatever happens in this prayer meeting. I give you everything I've got to give, including myself. I lay it all at your feet for real right now, Jesus. I'm just asking, please, by all means, make me holy. Spirit, make me holy. Soul, that i got to be holy. Body, make me holy. Garments, make me holy. God, everything that I am, all that I can be, make me as Christ is holy. And I he did. And I know that what happened today began, that something happened in a real way, but it was still only the beginning of something that grow. In Acts chapter 2, you're looking at a people that walked with Jesus for a few years, unlearned men that were bold. And it says they gathered in a place. And I'm telling you, when you read the rest of the chapter, you see that they had all things common, that they sold their goods to support each other. In other words, they weren't worried about gaining wealth in this life. They weren't trying to build their own kingdom. They weren't trying to have a mansion on the corner. They weren't trying to have a ministry that brought in millions, not for the sake of giving to the poor, but for the sake of building a ministry. They weren't worried about any of that. They sold all they had so that they could support each other and then lay down their life for the gospel. I'm telling you, you won't find any evidence in the book of Acts of them doing anything but selling out to Jesus 100%. And I'm convinced that as a sold out group of people collectively carried in a place, then the Holy Ghost was poured out upon them. And when that fire filled them, the Holy Ghost gave them utterance. Now let me tell you something. The menorah, that's the candlestick with nine branches. There's nine branches because that's how many gifts of the Spirit there are. The middle branch that divides the other four on each side is the gift of tongues. And I'm telling you, the moment that you get filled with the oil of God, tongues is there. You may not have opened your mouth and spoken them yet, but if you've been filled with the Spirit, it is there. It's there. Now I know people that were filled with the Spirit and it took them a while to figure out how to yield to God and let it flow. I'm telling you folks, if you lay your life down like the apostles did, if you lay your life down even in a fraction like I really believe I did in the office today, then you won't be able to contain what comes out of your mouth. And I was laying there on the floor, didn't care who saw me, didn't care if people were looking in the window, didn't care what folks saw, overflowing in the spirit. I felt a fire burning. I felt an energy, a wave of energy. I felt a pressure and a thing just happening right here in my soul, in my lamp, in the seat of my soul here was just being filled. I knew it was. And I was thinking the whole time, God, I thank you. I've missed this this whole time. I know for sure that's what went away. Why did it go away? Because I started to live for me. Why did it go away? Because I picked back up some things that were crucified with Christ because I said I want to resurrect me and do things my way God I'm going to allow some sin into my life I'm going to allow some pleasure that you don't like to happen into my life I'm going to begin to bend on my convictions I'm going to begin to snuff out things that were once unholy unto me I'm going to begin to shut out what you're telling me and allow things of my life and I'm telling you in that moment of sin many years ago I felt something pull away from my soul 
And nothing's been the same since. But folks, today, as I laid my life down, as Peter said in Mark chapter 10, verse 28, God, we've laid it all down. We've left everything to follow thee. Folks, I'm telling you for sure, there's no doubt in my mind that when you really do lose your life for Christ's sake, you will gain his. When you lay your life down at the altar and the feet of Jesus, that you will walk away somebody different. That God's going to be faithful to pour into you the promise that he said he would give unto you. Verse 15. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Let's go to Joel. Let's see what he said. I've never in my life equated surrender to baptism, Holy Ghost. But I'm convinced after what's happened and the verse the Lord gave me that you really can't separate them. And I'll say this as much as I really don't like the holiness movement right now. That it appears as if there's something correct about the idea of soul sanctification in order to be overflowing with the Holy Ghost. That there is something there that's not incorrect. There's some wrong doctrines, but something there that says when you've laid your life down, that's what the soul sanctification is really saying. When you've really given yourself to Christ, set apart, laid it all down, at that point in time, there's an overflow that you won't otherwise experience. And I'm telling you, I found out the truth in that today. Joel, what chapter is it? Chapter 2, verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in that day will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood, fire, pillars of smoke. Folks, I'm telling you, the apostle Peter told us, the apostle Peter spoke it in Mark 10 when he said, I've left everything for your sake. And in Acts chapter 2, again, he says, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. The same man that spoke in Mark chapter 10 is the same one we see in Acts chapter 2. The apostle Peter, he says, look, I laid my life down in Mark 10. I know some issues have happened since then, but I'm telling you, in Acts chapter 2, he did it again. And when he did it again, there came a Holy Ghost fire that filled his tabernacle. And when people mocked him and said, why are you so weird? When your family says, why don't you want to talk about the weather? When your family says, how come you don't want to talk about the game? Because this is what was spoken by the mouth of the prophet. The prophet Joel in chapter 2 He says that your spirit shall come upon me And I'll prophesy and I'll dream dreams That's what the prophet said That's why I can't talk about the weather with you That's why the game doesn't matter to me Because I'm overflowing with Jesus I'm overflowing with the spirit I can't do anything but think about the Lord My heart is a cup overflowing for the Lord right now What am I saying? It's not deep theology I'm telling you that here in a minute There's going to be some music and truth is, it should be on this blue speaker because nobody should be left out. And we really, really need to remove the idea of pals, remove the idea of three to four minutes at the altar and come to this place while the music plays with the intent of giving your life to Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about going to heaven, being saved in your spirit. I'm talking about laying your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions, your affections, your house, your home, your family, your car, your job, your income, your everything at the feet of Jesus and saying, you're Lord of it. You created it. I thank you for it, but it's yours. I lay it at your feet. In essence, I cast my crown before you. And I'm saying, God, do with me as you will. Do with me what you want. Work in me a work that only you can work. I'm asking Lord Jesus that right now you set a fire that burns in me, that you can be glorified in all that I say and do. Everywhere I go is a testimony of the goodness of God. When people come in with coarse jokes, they hear a sharp, sharp, powerful word by the Spirit of God. When people come in and want to make fun of their neighbor, they hear the love of God outpouring through me in such a way that conviction breaks their heart. When, when I run into folks at the grocery store with tattoos and piercings and I don't think there's any chance God would want to save them, I know that because the oil of the Holy Ghost is burning within me, overflowing, that because of that, I've given my life to you. I 
I can go about and testify of a God that would save them just the same. That I could be a true witness full of signs and wonders and miracles and boldness when I speak the word of God. That I could be a true witness that is like unto Jesus Christ when I go. That they see and hear what they would see and hear from Jesus. That they experience in me what they would experience in him. That's the point of this, folks. We can't afford to live another day as the church that is passive in regards to giving ourselves to the Lord. We can't afford to live not one more day as a church that's passive when it comes to laying our life down at the feet of Jesus. We have got to be a people, like Peter said in Mark chapter 10, I have left all to follow thee. I've not said, what's that look like? I've not asked about tomorrow. I said, I have left all to follow thee, Jesus. Now I'm asking that you make me holy. I'm asking that you fill me with fire. I'm asking asking that you make me like you. I'm asking that you pour yourself out. I'm asking Jesus, have your way in me, Lord. You are worthy. I praise you. Not another day living for me. I give myself to you. At your feet, I've left all to follow thee. I am crazy. I'm telling you, I'm right. I'm telling you. The hardest thing for people is to get their hands off of it and let God Folks, I'm telling you, if you self-examine right now and say, you know what, my life, it's just not being what I know it could be. I've, I've loved Jesus. He knows it. His grace is always on me. His presence is always on me. I feel him when I pray. I experience him. He keeps me. He never lets me go. He never leaves me. He never forsakes me. That's the life I was living. I'm confident in Christ. I felt Christ. I walked with Jesus. Still testifying, still praying for the sick, still seeing things, still doing all that I know that I was called to do, still walking in it. But I knew deep down in my heart, God, there's more. There's more. And no matter how much I've tried and all that I've done and all that I've thought to do, none of it's really done it. None of it's really caused it to come to pass. God, something went away in that first year of my salvation. Something stopped on that day. And I remember it. I remember where I was. I remember what I was doing. I remember what it felt like. Why? Because it was one of the most detrimental things to my Christian faith. And a lot of things changed. And some of you here and folks on the other side of that camera right now have been living your life in a place where you thought, you know what, this is good. Everything's great. I'm walking with God. Things are well. But I know something in me says there's more. There's greater. And I'm telling you folks, it's, it's really hard to understand or take a hold of it until you really step into it. And the moment you do, you say, man, I missed it. I've been missing it this whole time. When I got up from that prayer meeting that I did not want to get up from this afternoon, I was bug-eyed. I was on the edge of my seat. I thought you could drag a man in a coma in here right now and he'd be well. Let one of my co-workers come in here talking twisted right now. They'll probably get born again. And I'm telling you, something shifted in such a real way. God showed me in such a clear, tangible way that it had everything to do with surrender. Everything to do with literally surrendering everything. Folks, I'm telling you right now that there's sin that I've committed, that if it came knocking on my door publicly, in six years from now, I'd be so ashamed it'd be hard to live. But because of what happened today, bring whatever you want. I'm not my own. I'm bought with a price. I'm going to glorify God in my body. I'm going to sell out to him. Tomorrow might look a lot different than today. And the next day might look a lot different than the day after that. But Jesus, I'm yours. Completely. I've left all to follow thee. You name it. I will swim to Peru and witness in the jungle if I make it all the way. I'll do whatever. You name it. I'll go to my workplace to the people that I used to joke with in a way that I shouldn't joke and say, I'm sorry. That was wrong. Whatever. Whatever. Folks, I'm telling you, the welfare of this church, the welfare of these that you've been praying for. I mentioned Denny Wolf at the beginning. I said there's a few reasons that I don't believe he was healed. One of which was division in the house. The religion and the division didn't allow for a flow like there should have been. 
And number two, was to allow his laying dry hands on the man. That 95% of the healings that you ever saw from me prior to today is faith healing. It was done through faith, not power. Faith can move mountains. Faith can do a lot. But only power breaks certain chains. And I'm convinced that if today had happened, that day he came in, that things would have gone a lot different. And I feel the Lord in that. You can't afford to miss it. You've got family, you've got loved ones, you've got co-workers that need somebody full of faith and power. The Bible says Stephen, who was stoned to death, was a man full of faith and power. I've done a lot of good functioning in faith, but it was not good enough. We have got to have faith and power. I'm telling you, folks, I'm convinced as the day is long that the promise of the power belongs to all of us. It belongs to everybody. But there's something about this surrendered life laying it all down to the Lord that can't be accomplished any other way. And I'm telling you, you go to a new realm, a new place. I can't deny what I experienced and what I currently feel and what I felt then. There's been so much shift and so much change. There's been things that people have said that I would normally respond to a certain way. It just didn't happen. I got a phone call, somebody going off the hinges today right before I came in. And I said, calm down, it's gonna be okay. Normally, I would get on their level and argue a little bit before God convicted me. But I'm telling you, there's been so much change in that one prayer. And the only thing that happened was surrender. Everything was surrendered. I believe God's challenging you to go from a place of good to supernatural. From a place of pretty well to intimacy, depth. Sacrifice, sold out, completely given unto him. Can you play us up for just a minute? Mm -hmm. Long enough for me to get my phone set so you can join us in prayer. There's a lot more I could say. And I don't want to overcomplicate what I'm trying to say. And I don't believe the Lord wants me to either. Folks, we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. But the power that raised Christ from the dead is in there. And I'm telling you, folks, to the avenue of giving yourself to Jesus and laying your life down, that's like putting your soul on the cross and saying, have me. And by doing it, I'm convinced that it opens floodgates of power and presence and glory. I don't want to contain a treasure and not get it out. Folks, I'm telling you, Something radical happened today. And I know that I know that I know that it was through the avenue of surrender in every respect to Jesus. And I believe God's calling you to a place of surrender just the same as me. God's calling you to a place of holy conversation, holy living, set apart, set apart for Jesus. And right now, I'm going to find some music and I'm going to lay here on the floor with the Lord. If I get to being in the floor too long, don't feel obligated to stay. You can leave. But I'm not rushing, and I recommend that you don't rush it either. That it would do us some good as a people to have an encounter with God. That it would do us some good as a people to find the, the thing in our heart that says, God, this is something I've been holding on to, or this is something I've been unsure about, or I've been afraid to step off the boat because of uncertainties. Today, I literally dove off a cliff of faith and said, God, I'm yours. I don't care what the bottom looks like. I'm not taking anything with me. It's all you. Folks, I believe as you give yourself to Jesus, as you tarry in that place, as the song says, as you abide there and, and wait upon the Lord, that you call out on his name and believe that he's going to do this thing that he said he would do. If you believe it belongs to you and you receive it, it'll happen. When I fell down on the floor, I imagined Jesus there. I thought about laying at his feet. I remembered his promise to say it was for me and for those afar off. I said, God, I got to have more. I believe and I receive. I never go to God saying, God, 
please give me something I don't have. Please do something. I'm not sure if you will. I'll go to God and say, I believe and I receive. God, today I give you my life. I lay it all down at your feet. I give you all that I have, everything that I am. And today I believe and receive the fullness of the Holy Ghost. Today I believe and receive the fire from heaven. I receive new oil. I receive overflow. I receive abundance. I go in a manner of faith saying, God, I know what you said and I know it belongs to me. I give you my life. I lay it down. And folks, we've got to approach him in such a way. Father, we need you. I'm asking that you do a work here tonight. I thank you for what you've started in me and what you're going to continue to do. And I'm asking God that you would do the same and greater in these that are here. And I'm asking God that you would help us to endure in prayer. I know, God, that today, 20 minutes had passed and I was ready to quit praying when there was a sudden shift and I felt on my face and my life changed. What if I would have quit 18 minutes into that prayer? And I thank you, God, that you caused me to not quit, that you caused me to not give in to the flesh in that moment. And I'm asking God that you cause the people to get into a position to where they can sense you, where they can hear you, where they can feel you. Allow your presence to be tangible in such a way that it encourages folks to pray and to seek you. And I'm asking, Lord Jesus, that you do that work tonight. Cause us to lay our life down for the kingdom of God and for Jesus Christ. I'm asking God that you have your way be Lord in all things. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Altars are open.